Today's reading is John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. It's headed, Jesus comforts his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place, you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, if you were here last week, uh, you would think, oh, did Stephen, uh, Stephen's preaching the same sermon again? Or he didn't think that sermon was that good, so he should preach some. Anyway, it's not like that. Uh, we, uh, just for your own interest, we're picking up the theme of David Mansfield's book called About Love, and it deals with the second half of John's Gospel. And we're going to keep picking up that theme all the way through to Easter. And so last week we sort of did an introduction to chapter 14 and we looked at about our King Jesus and the promises our King Jesus makes. So we looked at that passage uh, in more, in, sort of in a big chunk. And now from this week on, we'll pick the, the, this passage up and move forward in smaller bite pieces. And what we're thinking about this morning is about heaven and the promises Jesus makes about heaven uh, to his disciples. So let me pray. And then uh, we'll look at John 14, 1 to 6. Heavenly Father, won't you help us now as we think about what your word says. Uh, we are thankful that we have these words of Jesus. Uh, we're thankful that the disciples had these words of Jesus and that these words give them a sense of assurance and hope. And we pray this morning, as we look at this passage together, that we would find that same sense of assurance and hope. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that works in and through us as we look at your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, this morning we're thinking about heaven. And uh, so I went on to the uh, Google search and did a search about heaven. There's so much that is written about heaven there's so much that is said about heaven and of course there's so much that has been sung about heaven so in doing this search i did a song select search on songs about heaven and there are hundreds of them i could sing this morning to you um, but i just wanted to pick out a few that i'm not going to sing to you uh, uh, songs about heaven Here's one, Stairway to Heaven. Uh, remember that one by Led Zeppelin. Then there's Knocking on Heaven's Door. Remember that? Uh, that was sung by Guns N' Roses. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, um, heaven Can Wait is a song that was done by Meatloaf. Um, then there is more recently, perhaps you younger folk will remember this one, Locked Out of Heaven by Bruno Mars. Um, and then there's the two classics, really. Uh, if you don't know them, you should know them, and you should go and listen to them. It's, of course, Eric Clapton's Tears in Heaven, a song dedicated to the loss of his son, who died tragically. And then probably the most famous, infamous one of them all is John Lennon's Imagine There Is No Heaven. Uh, really interesting, isn't it? Um, so it got me thinking about what people think about when they think about heaven. For instance, is there this massive stairway that you and I will have to climb up uh, long and hard like Rocky to get to heaven? And when we get to heaven, are there these massive wooden doors uh, that prevent you from entering into heaven and you've got a knock, knock, knock on heaven's door. Or, of course, more on a Christian tradition, are there the pearly gates where St. Peter is standing, waiting to welcome you into heaven? 
Is that the picture, the image of heaven that you might have? Is heaven achievable? Uh, that is, can you get into heaven? Or, like Bruno Mars, have you been locked out of heaven? Or, sadly, Eric Clapton, who hopes that his son is in heaven, hopes that his son will remember him in heaven, but Clapton knows in the lyrics that he does not belong in heaven. Pretty tragic, isn't it? And then, of course, you've got someone like John Lennon who reckons if we could just stop talking about heaven, um, the world would be a so much better place. In actual fact, if we got rid of the concept of heaven and hell altogether, if we got rid of the concept of religion completely altogether in this world, he thinks or suggests that heaven could be found here on earth. The brotherhood of man is part of his lyrics of his song. It's ironic, though, that one of those brothers takes a gun and shoots him and kills him. What is your concept of heaven? When you think about heaven, what does that place look like to you? Heaven is a place, but what do you expect to find when you get there? It's interesting, isn't it, that when Jesus speaks about heaven, he doesn't necessarily speak and, and share much and say much about the place. He talks about a room, doesn't talk to you about the interior of the room, doesn't talk to you about the color palette, doesn't talk to you about the furniture, doesn't talk to you much about anything really when he talks about the place. And so I wonder if you and I could have a conversation with Jesus, whether we could say to Jesus, Jesus, really, you, you need to up your game when we talk about heaven. Because at this point in time, it really sounds quite boring. Like I've heard so many people say, um, heaven can wait. Rather, if there's a choice between heaven and hell, I might prefer to go to hell because that's where the fun is and that's where all my friends are, right? What is it about human beings that we associate so much importance in place? Why is place so important to you and I? Word association. I'm not going to get you to respond. I thought to ask you to respond with the word association, I just went, it could just be chaos. And then you just kill the illustration. So I'm going to do it, right? Word association. When I think Sydney, I think Opera House. Did, did you get that? And most of you go, Sydney Opera House? No, you see, you wouldn't help. Anyway, Sydney, I think Opera House place. Melbourne, I think MCG, sporting capital of the world. I know, I know, you have no interest in that. Maybe the markets, uh, maybe the shopping. Is there anything else in Melbourne? No, it's, it's the sporting capital of the, of the world, right? It's the MCG, it's this week coming up, or next week, or in the next couple of weeks, the Rod Laver Arena tennis. Oh, glorious tennis. Don't you love it? Anyway, um, Brisbane, I think... Uh, Sunshine Coast. Fantastic. Although when I think about the Sunshine Coast this weekend, it's pretty tragic news how those two helicopters collided in each other. People going for a holiday with family and friends, trying to make wonderful memories. <sighs> pretty sad, isn't it? Cairns. When I think about Cairns, I think Great Barrier Reef. And there's this fish called Bluey. I think maybe it's not called Bluey. <laughs> Is that the dog? That's the dog. Anyway. <laughs> not Nemo. Anyway, there's this big blue fish that everybody gets to see and touch, and you take your kids there. Anyway, uh, that's right. And it's not just Australia where you think about 
place word association and immediately iconic images come to mind. That is true wherever you go in the world, right? London, Big Ben, right? The palace. You can see I haven't traveled much. Anyway, uh, America, Times Square, the place where the two towers used to stand. Uh, what's that thing where they, uh, the girls got the thing? Sta Thank you very much, Statue of Liberty. Um, Russia, the Kremlin. No, okay, we don't talk about Russia at the moment. They're not, in, they're not in our good books. Uh, but you get the idea, right? Whenever we, whenever we kind of stir up our emotions or uh, kind of get excited, it's always about place. And there's always kind of iconic images we connect to those places, right? Place is so important to us. So much so that if you travel throughout Australia, not to the major cities, but even to the countrysides and the local towns, you will find iconic, iconic, world famous things. <laughs> yeah, you are such a safe wavelength as me. Uh, um, big banana, big pineapple. Uh, um, is Robertson got the big, the big what? The big spud, the big spud. Isn't that marvelous? Uh, anyway, that, that's how you and I think and operate, right? And what is it about us that we're so fascinated by place? And if you thought heaven was all about place, you're going to be disappointed. Because heaven is not about place and iconic images you find in that place. No, heaven is about people. Heaven is about relationship. Do you see what Jesus says? He says to his disciples, he's about, you know, the con you remember the context of what's going on here? Jesus has had a meal with his disciples. He's telling them that he's about to leave them and he, won't, he will no longer be with them. And he's, he's telling them that he has to suffer and die. And they've had this meal together and now he's preparing for his departure. And in the context of preparing for his departure, the disciples are kind of like overwhelmed with anxiety because of what is going on. Because they are so into place and the significance of the place. This is Jerusalem. This is the promised land. This is the king that was promised. This is the Jesus that entered Jerusalem triumphantly on a donkey. This is Jesus that's going to overthrow the powers of the day and he's going to reestablish Israel's place in Jerusalem at the palace, at the temple. They're going to rebuild the temple. This is the image that these disciples have in their mind. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, I am about to leave you, but do not be troubled. You trust in God, by the way, the God that you cannot see, because God is not flesh and bones, but God is spirit. You believe in that God who you cannot see, now believe also in me. And then he talks about heaven. And what does he say about heaven? He says, in my father's house are many rooms. Jesus is not that interested in giving the disciples the details of the room. But emphasizing this that God is there and God is my father and I am going back to my father and when I go back to my father when the relationship between me and my father is restored I will have a place for you 
and then I will come and I will take you to that place, don't focus on place, where you will be where I am. Where you will be with me, Jesus says. And you will be with my Father. That's what heaven is all about. Heaven is about being in the presence of God. Heaven is about being in the presence of Jesus Christ, God's Son. It's about being in relationship with God. It's about being in relationship with Jesus. It's not so much about place, but it's about people. I've been in Australia for 25 years, and in that time, worked out, I think I've been here as long now as I have in my home of birth. Anyway, I've had the opportunity to go back to South Africa on two occasions in that 25 years. And every time I've gone back to South Africa, um, I am a little bit sentimental. My wife just can't stand it, but I am. So when I go back, I don't take her with me. She goes on her own, I go on my own. Although she's insisting that this year we go together. Anyway, uh, the thing I've done both times is I've hired a car and I've gone back to the place of my childhood. Ever done that? Ever gone back to the place of your childhood? For some of you, where's, where's Ray? She's never left the place of her childhood. <laughs> Did, oh, sorry. There was, there's a new book that came out uh, last year, 200 Years Embargo. And I think, uh, I think Ray features in every chapter. <laughs> Maybe that's not altogether true. It's not altogether true. <laughs> but I had this wonderful opportunity to go back to the place of my birth. And I've been, the two times I've been there, I've been back twice. And as I pull up at the house, I pull up on the opposite side of the road because I don't want to be creepy. And then I stop and I just look over at the house where I was raised, where I spent 17 years of my life, right? Because we were settled, that's where, because that's what people do, right? You buy a home and you stay there. That's your place. And um, anyway, as I looked at the bricks and mortar, they sort of faded away. And what brought me a sense of great joy was not the place, but the memories and the people in that place. The memories of my mother and father, the memories of my brothers and sisters, the memories of one of those... um, uh, hair brushes back in the day when we used to have perms. I never, I promise, I never had a, I never had a perm, <laughs> but my brother had a perm, and he had, he had one of those hair brushes that um, you could curl and do the perm thing with, and the end of the hair brush went into a point, right? And I think the idea of the end of the point was that you could do the pick thing, right? Anyway. My memory of all of that is being so angry with my brother at one time, or maybe he was angry with me. But anyway, he threw the the brush like a knife, and it stuck into the back of the door as I closed the door. Anyway, we got into a fair bit of trouble. But that's the, besides that, that's, that's it, isn't it? It's as I was sitting there and remembering that place, it wasn't the place so much as the people, the relationships, the memories, the 300 meters down to my first primary school, the two kilometer walk, listen young people, the two kilometer walk from the house to the train station every day to get on a train to go 20 kilometers down the rail to my high school. And then back on the train, back onto the station, back two kilometer walk with a heavy bag on the back after getting six of the best on the behind for being in trouble for doing something stupid at school. That's what it's about, isn't it? It's not about the place. It's, it's about the people. 
I've lived in Australia for 25 years. Ray, hold on to your chair. And in that time, I counted, we have moved to eight different places. Sorry, my wife says nine. Nine different homes in 25 years. That should make me feel pretty displaced, don't you think? But why? Because place doesn't matter. People matter. And in those nine places, I have had the privilege to do life with hundreds of different people. People that have impacted my life and hopefully under God, people I've had the opportunity to impact theirs. Why is this so important? Because here's the promise that Jesus makes. That I will see all those people again in his place. In his home. See, what you need to understand of what Jesus is doing here, though he's about to leave his disciples and he won't see them again. The next day he will be arrested, falsely accused, beaten, flogged, put on a cross, and die. He says to his disciples, I am leaving you to prepare a place for you. Do you think Jesus means that he's going up on a stairway to heaven through the doors, the wooden doors, and there into a room, and in that room, he's going to go, I'm not going to pick on Ray again, let me pick on someone else. Um, what would so-and-so like in their room? Might they like a double bed? Might they like one of those special beds that kind of flick up and flick down and do you think that is the preparation that Jesus is doing in heaven? No, here's the preparation. The language that Jesus is using in John 14 is the language of marriage. The disciples are the bride of Christ. And in first century Jewish customs, the way the wedding happened was this way. You had an engagement that neither couple almost knew anything about. Imagine that. The engagement happened between the in-laws. It was arranged marriages. The in-laws determined that these two should get together and be married, and so they have an engagement, a contractual arrangement, where they suggest and put these two together. Then there is the betrothed, betrothal. And what happens there is the groom leaves the bride behind and he goes back to his father's house to prepare a place to bring his future wife, his bride, into their home so that she might become part of the family. That is the imagery Jesus is using. He is saying to his disciples, you are my bride. And in my death, in my crucifixion, I take the punishment you deserve and stand in your place so that you are welcome into my father's house. That's what he's saying. It's pretty profound, isn't it? 
Jesus is saying, do not be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I am going to prepare a place for you. It is not about the place. It's about the people that fill that place. Bruno Mars suggests he is locked out of heaven. And I'm not suggesting you go listen to the song, please, right? But if you do listen to the song, you discover why he's locked out of heaven. Because the song is all about a sexual encounter. And that is his image of heaven. Eric Clapton has a tragic loss of his son. And he's hoping so much that his son will be in heaven. And that he'll get to see him in heaven. But Eric Clapton knows he doesn't belong in heaven. And Jesus says, you are welcome in my father's house. I have made a place for you. There is no stairway. There are no wooden doors. Humanity is not locked out of heaven. If you choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus in his death and resurrection has prepared a place for you where you can dwell. Do you believe that? Do you? If you didn't, then let me assure you of that reality. And why am I so assured of that reality? Because of the promise of Jesus. Jesus says to his disciples, I will not leave you alone. Though I've returned to my father, I will send you a comforter. And the comforter is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God who comes and dwells in you. And you and I now have the first fruits of heaven. We are kind of walking billboards of heaven. And it's not because we gather in this place, this place of bricks and mortar. It's not because we, we gather in this building. It's because we as individuals corporately are the bride of Christ. We have the first fruits of heaven in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is transforming you and me more and more into the likeness of Jesus. That Holy Spirit has given us the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And we display the fruits of the Spirit as we gather together. But the Holy Spirit has also given us gifts. And we use the gifts of the Spirit to build each other up. So that if someone like John Lennon came into our church today, he might look at us and the way we behave, not at our buildings, not at our symbols, but he would look at you and me and the way we treat each other and he would say, heaven is on earth. Because it's not about the place. It's about the people. Why am I so passionate about you and me gathering every Sunday year together? Why am I so sad when you're not here? Because we are the people of God. We have the Spirit of God. 
and we are living out in this world here and now heaven small glimpses of it of what it will be like for all eternity God's people gathered together heaven is not so much a place but it's a people people gathered around the father do you know how profound that is to be gathered around God people in the very presence of Jesus people filled with the Holy Spirit that's why as Christians we aren't so attached or shouldn't be so attached to place here on earth at this time but we should be more interested in people and people getting into heaven where there is no staircase where there is no door where people are not locked out why because Jesus has stood in our place and he's made a home for us let me pray Heavenly Father we're so thankful that you have given us the Holy Spirit which is the deposit the down payment of what heaven will be like we are so thankful that you have called us the bride of Christ we're so thankful that Jesus was willing to stand in our place so that our relationship could be restored with you thank you for the transforming work of the Holy Spirit that is making us more like Jesus every day thank you for the gifts of the Spirit that enables us to serve one another so that we can show a world that is in disarray and brokenness and sadness. We could show them a small glimmer of what heaven is like. Please won't you help us not to be rooted to place in this world at this time. But please won't you help us to be committed to seeing people enter into your eternal kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.